across the country elicited various reactions from the public in the early 20th century. These were most vivid among the members of the religious establishment and the intellectuals who viewed this side of sociability as corruptive, imitative of the Western cinema, and advocative of values that were not indigenous to Iran. Instead of relying on a conventional history of pre-revolutionary cinema infected by a deliberate historic amnesia, this paper implements a historiographical view to reread the cinematic developments of the late 1950s to 1970s Iran. Amidst what have been termed as the progressive projects of urbanization and modernization of the Pahlavi dynasty in Iran, the introduction and age-old growth of cinema and the art of filmmaking was an inevitable process. However, since its very inception, Iranian cinema was confronted with moral criticisms aimed at the side of sociality that it facilitated. Hakami Zadeh, for example, in the journal Homayun, associated the moral corruption of the youth, Fesoda Akhlaqi Javanan, as, um, and the impurity of women, be a Fatia Zanan, to the youth's imitation of cinema and its advertisements. Reza Mazluman, in the Islamic journal Maktab Moms, 1976, rendered imitation or Hamanandi as one of the most important creations of cinema. According to him, this inclination towards mimicry, male betakli, was one of the main factors in the dissemination of criminal acts in the Iranian society of pre-revolutionary period. The last four gatherings of the cinema Majavis Shafat and Giza Cinema were considered as corruptive since the instrument for the meeting and the bonding of females and males were fully arranged. Thus, the heterotopic space of cinema, which created a space of illusion for and of the others, and the dark ambiance of the movie theaters were conceived as dystopic spaces that advocated irreligious deeds, disseminated psychological corruption, and prompted social crimes. In the words of Bahman Farmanara, an acknowledged film director of pre- and post-revolutionary Iran, the film productions of the altar cinema and the festivals of the time work to enhance the mindset of the people and boost their expectations of cinema through interaction with the outside world. As, as such, the art and literature of the time, including cinema, he said, fashioned forward a revolution of thought in pre-revolutionary Iran. I seem to recall from my first glances at Tehran, the capital city of Iran about 50 years ago as a provincial youth coming from Mashhad and being struck by the dichotomies between the cinema and the, mo and the, mat and the mosque. Uh, how in, in one narrow alley in, on Istanbul Avenue, there was a mosque and a cinema. And on the, uh, above the doorstep, the entrance of the mosque, it said, those who choose that way will go to hell, essentially, <laughs> through, through a Quranic verse. So it's, it's an amazing feat, in fact, that many of our, of, of, of our presenters have, have alluded to, that this dichotomy itself has been now moderated, not by the force of the state, but by pressures from below, from the society itself. The paper presented here um, is an introductory fragment of a larger project envisioned to accomplish a historiography of the graphic arts in Iran, particularly in their relation to the genre of advertising commercial art. As such, the paper aims to draw attention to the crucial role of, role of Tofir magazine in its introduction of a modern visual vernacular to the language of graphic design in Iran. Through a comparative analysis of a handful of ads running between 1960 and 1963 <coughs> in Tofir and Etelata 101, another, mag another magazine of the approximately the same period in Iran, I aim to illustrate how Tofir advertisements provide an alternative to the prevalent image of modernity as imported, homogenous, and anticipated. Here a short clarification on the concept of vernacular modernity to the capacity employed in this paper might be in order. As Umbach and Hubach point out in vernacular modernism, high globalization, and built environment, 
Quote, any attempt to provide a consistent definition of vernacular modernism runs into semantic problems because the vernacular denotes a specific relation to place, whereas modernity denotes a historical period and a general mental disposition. End quote. Thus, the model of vernacular modernity evades a specific definition, not only due to the fluidity of each other two concepts, but also due to difficulty in correlating two notions that are categorically different. The theoretical dilemma, however, does not exclude the possibility of mapping the concept inside the framework of modernity, not necessarily as its constitutive other, but as a defining particular practicality in modernity's construction of subjectivities. By doing so, Umbach and Hupaf aspire to an understanding of modernity not in, not, not in its ideal universalized form of coherence, but as a collection of contingencies at points of rupture that do not share a definitive picture of future, but are simultaneous and innovative nonetheless. A brief look at the history of advertisement in Iran provides a much needed historical context. According to the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance Advertising Bureau, the, face, the first advertisement company in Iran, Ziva, was published in Iran in 1937, and by 1950, a mere 20 years later, there were more than 18 advertisement companies registered only in Tehran. These companies' ads in magazines such as Atalata, Monawan, and Tofi are mostly original productions that nevertheless utilize some stylistic pro profiling of the products in their imported formats. Ads running in Atalata, Monawan, and Tofi, although stylistically rather diverse, fit into two very broad categories, ones that are signed off by advertisement companies and ones that are either directly borrowed and translated from their Western, mostly European counterparts, prototypes, or designed by and in the style of their respective publications. Even though the boundaries of these categories are rather forgiving, in other words, some ads that are translations could also be signed off by an advertisement company, the distinction would allow for closer tracing of the style of the ads in relation to the artistic style of the publication. I uh, was most interested, of course, in the notion of how Rostam fares in, <laughs> in the Tawfiq commercials, which is an important thing, not only Rostam, but so many other heroes. And if you go to poetry and to, let's say, Akhavan's Khan Hashtun, you will see how helpless Rostam appears on television later in the figure of the Shah uh, advising the young people to forget about the dead past and simply adopt the ways of the future. The title of my paper, as you can see, is Fictions of Modernity. And um, the pun in the title on the word fictions is meant to problematize uh, the notion of modernity when it's deployed as and used as a, a homogenous and imported uh, notion. And, uh, and as we know, in the, in the context of Iranian, modern Iranian fiction, uh, that's usually associated, well, almost always associated with Sadr Hedayat, uh, and especially Bufakur. So, uh, and I think its presence, the, 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 the gigantic presence of, of Bufakur, I think overshadows uh, fiction writing to this day in Iran. Uh, I'm problematizing that notion, nothing against Sadr Hedayat, of course. Uh, the almost standard axiom in literary histories of modern Iran asserting that Sadr Hedayat's The Blind Owl is the first modern Persian novel is symptomatic of a historicist approach to modernity. First, such linear staging and universalizing of history deploys the latent politics of temporal hierarchy. If we were to put this statement about The Blind Owl, published 1936, side by side, a similar statement about the first modern European novel, generally ascribed to Don Quixote, Don Quixote, published 1605, we would see through a simple mathematical calculation the politics behind the linear temporal logic. Literary modernity in Iran is some 332 years behind Europe and therefore has a lot of catching up to do. The embodiment of the two contending discourses of Iranian modernity are the figures of Jahel and Fokoli, and this is the main argument of my paper. These character symbols are the archetypal presentations, representations of modern Iranian politics of social identity two strategies of societal development. Set primarily in urban contexts, these ar archetypes, as the quintessential polarities of contemporary Iranian character, are engaged in continuous disciplining and counter-disciplining within a site of contesting narratives of identity. The dysfunctional families of these novels, or of the Jahel Fokoli fraternity, stage a turbulent and contested process of identity formation. These family romances are engaged in the same struggles for a self-definition against the perceived superiority of an other, as are the victims in the psychology of neurosis. Uh, the rivalry between this, these two is not very easy, 
and it's not completely polarized. So you never get Foucault is good, Jahan is bad, or Jahan is bad, Foucault is good, or, or vice versa. Um, cinematic treatments are always, and there's always a kind of, certain kind of Jahil which is going to bad. There's also a mix, you know, when you think of the figure of Fardin, I mean, he's got the Jahil in, in him without the mustache and yeah. the hat. Uh, and he's got, but he's got the Jahil attributes. And, but he's also got the Foucault look. In this paper, I explore the emergence of two contemporaneous public dancing subjects in the 20th century Iran, the popular dancing of cabaret and European social dancing, and the high art dance genre of raps and melli performed on polite theatrical stages. I argue that the national dancer constructed throughout the 20th century is defined to that distantiate itself from the dancer in the cabaret who was often associated with immorality and social corruption. The nationalistic themes became especially prevalent in per performing arts in Reza Shah's era and can be tranced in the choreographic works of the 1920s, such as Bale Beirag Iran, Iranian Flag Ballad, and Taj Eftekhar, The Crown of Pride. The pioneers of these dances were mostly Armenian Iranians or immigrants from other countries, including Pari Agababov or Agabayov and Madame Corneli, who danced as part of, a part, of, uh, part of theatrical and musical performances. The, the trend became more popular in the second Pahlavi period, making the invention of Raqs and Melli a genre which fuses Iranian themes of movements into balletic dances and is inspired by the genre of national dance prevalent in the 19th century romantic ballet. The first major government-funded national dance project was initiated by 19, in 1946 by Nila Cook, the cultural attaché of the American Embassy, leading to the creation of the National Ballet of Iran in 1956 and the Iran National Folklore Organization in 1967. Many authors warned about the ways dancing could disseminate corruption in the Iranian society by distracting the youth and destroying the family structure. Young women were specially advised against the corrupt nature of Western partner dancing, which could cause them to lose their virginity. <laughs> this attitude stands in contrast to some nationalists and women's periodicals, including Iran Boston and Mehrban, which encouraged women to practice dance as a physical exercise. I believe that it was in, a, in relation to these negative discursive constructions that the comparatively chast and virtuous female dancing subject of Raksam and Libas constructed, being purged of all negative char characteristics linked to the undisciplined cabaret dancer. The national dancer's ballet trained disciplined body was desexualized by her authentic looking clothing. Instead of dancing in the cabaret, the national dancer appeared in polite gatherings. Then this newly constructed dancing subject act as it acted as a means to convey the glory of Iranian history and literature to audience, which often included the Iranian elite and foreign guests and the dignitaries. The movement, the most defined character, defining characteristic of dance, differ radically in all these genres, while the, both, both the cabaret and national dance share movements from Iranian popular social dance, raqs mehuni or as termed by Dr. Shay, as Iranian solo improvised dance, um, which include the rotations of wrists, triplet steps, yek dose. The cabaret dancer also accentuates her hips and chest, distancing itself from the sexual resemblance of cabaret. The national dancer's dance is rather carefree and stylized. <laughs> the, the whole panel, I think, it was very rich in terms of the dialogics, if the concept of dialogics were a little bit expanded to include debate, to include point-counterpoint, to include basic, basically facing up to a rhetoric and facing a rhetoric down, and so on and so forth. So I think th there's, there's tremendous ground to be explored here, and we have started the work, but of course, you know, the work will never be finished, but I hope you'll take it to to, to its logical conclusion. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for all these presentations.